ask you this morning, can, can you raise your hand for me if you would consider yourself an optimist? Maybe that's you, all right. Here's the thing, not everybody is an optimist though. And sometimes, here's what you seem like to the rest of us. You catch the flu and yet you try and be happy about maybe losing a little weight. You hear a tornado siren go off, and you're going to the shelter with your family like, oh, I love spending time close to them. And you can have a tree fall on your house, and you go out there, well, at least I have to rake less leaves next year. <laughs> you're that person on the Titanic as it's going down saying, I've always wanted to ride in those little boats, and the water probably is warmer than it looks. You're always doing fine, even when you're not. It makes the rest of us sick, I'm sorry. <laughs> An optimist may have invented the airplane, but a pessimist invented the parachute. Oh. Raise your hand if you consider yourself a pessimist. Anybody willing to own up to that here? Yeah, pessimists, they're, they're among us. Um, and the only problem is that not everybody is a pessimist, and here's what you seem like to the rest of us. <laughs> You not only think the glass is half empty, you think it's probably poisoned as well. In fact, you're actually relieved when stuff goes wrong because it validates the hours and hours of time you've spent worrying about it. You don't feel like your time was wasted. You're the person that's sitting there while Oprah's giving out free cars, grumbling about the extra taxes you're probably going to have to pay on it. You know, sometimes you make Eeyore look cheerful. Or a pessimist. I want to talk to you guys today about hope. And I want to just make it very clear from the beginning that hope, as the Bible describes it, has actually very little to do with being an optimist or a pessimist. So I'm going to tell you, those pessimists in the group, there is hope for you. You can be hopeful. Let's start with like the absolute baseline hope the Bible talks about it. You'll find it in the book of Ecclesiastes. The writer of Ecclesiastes says this, anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. So check your pulse this morning. If you're not dead yet, well, there's at least hope in that. Now, I think most of us, though, would say, like, I generally aim for more hope in my life than saying, well, I'm slightly better off than a corpse. So let's continue. <laughs> Romans 12, 2 says this, Be joyful in hope. You know, I'm talking about this because I don't want you to miss out. I, I don't think anyone is intentionally miserable in their life. I don't think, I, I've met people who don't like chocolate and don't like bacon. I can't really understand that. But I've never met anybody who says, like, happiness, joy, peace, hope. I don't want any of that in my life. This is a command here. Be joyful. You can hear the kids downstairs being joyful right now. <laughs> now you might ask yourself, well, if, if I have to be joyful in hope, if hope produces joy, where can I get me some of that? Let's start out where you shouldn't be looking for it. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 7 says this. Hopes placed in mortals... Die with them. All the promise of their power comes to nothing. Now that is proved true over and over and over again. You probably missed it. I don't think any of you went to the fire festival earlier this year. Uh, it was back in, I think, uh, April or May time frame. And so they began to build this music festival. It would be a weekend on an exclusive island. The food served by celebrity chefs, the top acts in music and entertainment and luxury. And the tickets starting at the low, low price of about $12,000. So all these young, very strangely wealthy people show up on this island full of hope for what the weekend would bring. And yet what they ran into looked more like a refugee camp. Soggy tents, trash everywhere, nobody knew what was going on. Things were horribly awry. They ended up stranded on the island. 
being served cheese sandwiches in styrofoam boxes instead of the celebrity chef meals they were expect expecting. And all of the world got to laugh at all these spoiled rich kids who didn't get what they'd hoped for. And yet, if we would point the finger and laugh at them, how often do we find ourselves in the same position? We have put our hope in things that turned out to be untrustworthy. Israel did this all of the time. And the reason why th this is in the book of Proverbs, Israel is this tiny country sandwiched between superpowers that were always fighting around them. And it was always so tempting for them to run, and they kept doing it. They ran to Egypt, saying, please help us, promise us that you'll protect us if somebody else attacks us. They ran to Assyria, saying, hey, we'll give you guys money, just protect us. You be our hope. When God had told them, I will be the one that protects you. And as often as they did this, as often as they ran to other people, and they promised them that they would protect them in their power, it didn't work out. It failed. So you have this also in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 13, verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. We all know the feeling when your hopes are crushed, when you feel yourself built up to something and it lets you down. I got a call last week and this couple just struggling facing eviction, trying to come up with the money to pay rent, and they got a check in the mail for $3,000. Oh, and they were so excited. And they took that check down to the bank, and they went to cash it, and they said, I'm sorry, this is a scam. These people are trying to take your money. We cannot, for your own good, cash this check. And they, they called me on the phone, and they were, they were still pleading with the people, can you just try and run it? Like, maybe it's not, a, I know it looks like a scam, maybe it's not, will you please try? And I got the sense as I talked to them that they ended up in a worse position than they had been that morning. Because they had allowed themselves to believe and to hope that this would be the answer. This is why uh, Nietzsche said the, the following, I had kind of a pessimistic view on life. Hope is the most evil of evils because it prolongs man's torment. And some of you, I think what has happened is that you have had your hopes so often crushed that you have convinced yourself that hope is the problem. And that the answer to living is to simply never have hope whatsoever to assume everything is going to go bad from the start and that way you'll never be disappointed. I know people in my family. This was their parenting decision. All of like the holiday characters from day one, they told their kids weren't real. But they told them, if you go into the woods, a bear will eat you. The boogeyman is real and living underneath your bed. <laughs> Don't ask me about how that worked out, but they figured it's, it's better not to give them any hope. That way they'll be like relieved when all their terror things aren't actually true. I don't know. We, we haven't done that with Christine, don't worry. And, and even if you've not been there, I'm saying like, I'll never believe in anything in my life ever again. We've all been burned. We've all come to that crushing moment when you realize, you know what, I, I am growing up and I will never be president, I will never be an astronaut or a giraffe like I had hoped to be. You hoped for a promotion or a raise and got laid off instead. You hoped the surgery would work and it didn't. You hoped your kids would grow up and turn out well and they end up rooting for the Packers. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I get to say what I want from the pulpit here. To keep hope alive. To keep hope alive, we need to stop misplacing it and put it where it really belongs. The New Testament talks about Jesus fulfilling the promises of the Old Testament, and this is one of them. In his name, the nations will put their hope. It is the echo of the Psalms over and over again. Those who put their hope in the Lord will not be put to shame. If you have your Bibles, open them to Romans chapter 4. We're going to look at, at what this looks like to put our hope where it belongs. 
Romans chapter 4, we are given some insight into the life of Abraham. God had given Abraham a promise. Abraham, you are going to be the father of many nations. I will bless them. I will give them this land that I'm sending you to. The only problem is that Abraham, as God is making this promise to him, is super old. Like, really old. And yet, here is what we're told about Abraham. Romans chapter 4, starting in verse 18. Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. God had pointed to the sky and said, can you count all those stars? Can you count the grains of the sand in the ocean? That's how numerous your offspring will be. Now here's the thing. Abraham was not an old guy just randomly hoping that he would have kids. In fact, if some of you came into church this morning and said, yep, um, I believe I'm going to have children this year, I would be concerned for you, very concerned. God made him a promise. That was the reason for his hope. And he believed it. Let me tell you, God has made you Promises today. Go to Christian bookstores and buy books full of just detailing the promises of God. Like when Jesus tells his disciples, Behold, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. So let me tell you this morning, with the promises that God has made to us, if we are not living a life that is filled with hope, we are living a life of disbelief. Abraham was filled with hope because he believed God. Abraham's faith, though, went well beyond the most optimistic person's assessment. An optimistic person at his age, I don't even know, you know what they, they would be optimistic about. You know, well, you know I'm a hundred years old, uh, maybe I'll be optimistic and say I'll live to see 120. An optimistic person wouldn't say, I'm optimistic, I believe I have the ability to have children. That person is crazy. Here's the thing. If we are living in the hope of God's promises the way we should, it will lead to us appearing crazy to other people. Because other people who do not have faith will at times look at our life, even the most optimistic of them, they will look at our life and they will say, you are crazy if you are not freaking out right now. <clears throat> Yet if we believe God's promises, we should raise some eyebrows from time to time. That's what Abraham did. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. You know, sometimes being optimistic means like turning a blind eye to the reality of a situation. Yes. Um, and, and thinking that like good things will happen. Sometimes Sarah and I joke about this, that, you know, that I'll be like standing in a burning house, you know, choking on smoke and being like, we probably just turned the heat up too much. It's not that this is fine. We're fine. But Abraham didn't do that. Now, if Abraham was being optimistic, he might say, well, maybe I'm not that old. Maybe Sarah's not either. Maybe she's been lying to me about her age and she was like negative 20 years old when we met. He didn't do it. Maybe he could be optimistic if he was totally ignorant about the way that these things worked. But even people during that time had figured out that men and women who were a hundred years old do not have babies. You don't need to worry, Miss Daisy. <laughs> no, what he did was he considered the deadness of his own body. And of Sarah. 
but it didn't destroy his faith or remove his hope. Because some of us, that's what we're afraid of. We're afraid that if we sit down and acknowledge things are really bad, that it will destroy our faith. It will be impossible to believe that good things can come. Yet Abraham didn't do that. He didn't stick his head in the sand. He said, yep, it is impossible for me to have kids. I still have hope. It is time for some of you to face the reality of your life. And you can still have hope. Here is how. He considered the deadness of his body and of Sarah's. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. But was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Now he faced this situation but he didn't dwell in it. You sit around and moment, oh, we're so old, it'll never happen. Listen, listen to the, the, the language it uses. Didn't waver, strengthened in his faith, fully persuaded. Now here's how we use hope wrong in our culture that makes it hard for people of faith to really take hold of it. We use hope as a word that describes things that are unlikely to ever happen. You see it cloudy outside and thunderclouds come and you say, what? I hope it won't rain. I go down to the water today and I say, I hope it's not cold. <laughs> yeah, maybe a miracle will happen. People say, I hope I win the lottery. I'm like the last 400 times they've played. You see, we use hope to describe a situation that I don't think will ever happen, but I would like it to. That is not how the Bible describes it. Yeah. Abraham didn't say, well, it'd be great to have kids. It'll never happen, but it'd be great. No, he was fully persuaded that this would happen. Going out and buying a crib, persuaded that this would happen. Why? Why? His hope was not a groundless optimism, but a confident faith because he knew that when God promised him something, he had the power to follow through. This kind of unwavering trust that produces a confident hope is not built on the facts of a situation because that will change. We, we find ourselves in situations and we say, you know, honestly, I see no way out of this. Humanly speaking, it is Physically impossible. And yet God is the one for whom nothing is impossible. Amen. That's why I started last week by talking about the character and nature of God. Because that matters. Is God who he says he is? Is he unchanging? Did he, with his own power, call the stars into existence? Did he bring Jesus Christ back to life after he had died? If he ever fails or comes up short, well, we should be hedging our bets and wavering in our hope. But if the same God who made these promises to Abraham, if he is still working today, if he has made promises to me, then really my only choices are hope and confident expectation or disbelief. Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 2 says this, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. This was the defining trait of Abraham's life. That he could be confident that God was going to do things that he hadn't seen him do yet. Now, some of us, you know, we'll, we'll after the fact say, yes, God did that. Isn't it great what God has done in my life? And that is great. You acknowledge that in thankfulness. But what God is calling you to today is you need to be more confident in him. We need to reclaim our boldness. Do you believe that God can do the impossible in your life? 
Do you believe that he can do the same in other people's lives? Do you believe that even in your darkest days that he remains unchanged? But let me tell you, this speaks, though, about what we do not see yet. Let me tell you, Abraham's greatest blessing in his life was not having a son. It brought incredible joy to him and Sarah, something that they had been longing for their entire lives. And that was, as the proverb says, a tree of life for them. But that wasn't his biggest blessing. His biggest blessing in life wasn't even the knowledge that his descendants would go on to possess the land that he lived in as a wanderer and a stranger. Abraham's greatest blessing was that he was welcomed into the presence of God and called righteous. At the end of the book of Romans, Paul writes about how all creation is groaning and waiting for God to bring all things to completion. And he writes this, Romans 8, 24 and 25. For in this hope, the hope of God making all things right, we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. Now we as Christians, we have hope for God's work in our lives right now. And yet there is this tension that exists for us. God has already blessed us, but the great majority of it has not yet happened. And that is why we need constant reminding that God is good. He is faithful. He is just. He is all-powerful. He will follow through because we will live our entire lives not having seen the fulfillment of his greatest promises to us. Now, he gives us little taste. You, you, you ever have God just show you undeniably, I am God and I will be faithful to you. He does that so that we can leads us along. He is gentle with us so that we can be confident in our expectation of him doing things in the future. So we say today, I am already forgiven, but I am not yet made perfect. You may have had God in your life already give you some measure of healing, some miraculous recovery from an illness, and yet there is a not yet. <clears throat> we look forward to bodies that are perfect and imperishable and immortal. I already know God. And all talking with some of you, it's so great to hear you growing in your faith in God, creating that hunger in you, and you learn more every day, and yet there's a not yet there. I know him, but one day I'm going to see him face to face. I'm going to know him as much as he knows me. I don't see that yet. I already have his spirit living in me. And that is incredible. And yet the Bible says that that is just a pledge. It is a down payment on the fullness of experience of heaven. That we're not even going to need the sun to shine. <laughs> that we will be his people and he will be our God. And he will sing over us and show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness towards us for all of eternity. Now, for some people, those words are the same kind of hope as somebody wants to win the lottery. It would be great. Doesn't it sound nice? And yet, if God is God, if his words are true, we put our hope in that. Remember when I, <laughs> I failed out of college had to break the news to my parents. It was at the same time that God had brought new life to me. And it was so weird because I called my parents up and now I had built all of my futures. I was going to be a neuroscientist. I was going to discover the things that nobody else had learned. And I was going to be world famous. That was my hope. 
And I call my family up. I'm like, hey, you know all that stuff I've been saying I was going to do since I was like five? Not happening. I'm going to work a shovel and it's going to be great. And it was so baffling for them that I sounded at that point more hopeful than I ever had before. And it wasn't because I had like some wishful thinking that like somebody's going to walk in and like, you know, just hand me a college degree that I won't have. No, I had soberly assessed my situation. I concluded, you know what? God is great in a way I don't understand. I have no idea what my, my life's going to hold. It could be shoveling asphalt and wrestling. I don't care. It's great. Because one day I'm going to stand before him. And at that point, I knew for the first time in my life that when I stand before him, it is going to be in confidence. I don't have to live in fear of one day seeing God. I can be confident in hope that when I see him, it is going to be amazing in a way I can't even, even understand. I want you this morning to have that kind of hope in your life. Now, I can't promise you what tomorrow will hold for you. I can't promise you that next week will be better than this week. I can't promise you that any of your five-year plans will come to pass. What I can promise you is that 10,000 years from now, if you are in Christ, you will be better than you have ever thought possible. That is our hope. That is our reason for rejoicing. Be joyful. God, you know, sometimes it is far easier to believe that our situation is impossible to fix than it is to believe that you are God who is able to do all things. You, you promise us even more than that, that you can do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, and that power is working within us. You call the dead to life. You split the oceans in half. The hills themselves melt at the coming of your presence. And you are bringing all things to an end. And you will make all things right. Will you give us the same faith that you gave Abraham? So that we can consider these promises, even the deadness of our own bodies and our own lives, and not waver, yet be fully persuaded that what you have promised, you are able to bring about. And let us rejoice in this hope. In Jesus' name. Thank mm -hmm. you.